Well, good evening, church. Uh, once again, excited to be around the Bible and to have a fellowship with a community of people who love the Word, who love um, to come around and to talk about Jesus, His glory, His beauty, His majesty, His cross, His suffering, and His coming day. Thank you for the prayers that you offered and I ask that you'd continue to pray. If you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 132. We're continuing to look at the Psalms about Jesus, and Psalm 132 is, is our next Psalm here. Verse 1 of Psalm 132 says, Lord, remember David and all his afflictions, how he swear unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house nor go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyelids, to my eyes, or slumber to mine eyelids, until I find a place for the Lord, a habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Lo, we heard of it at Ephrath. We found it in the fields of the wood. We will go into his tabernacles. We will worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. Let thy priests be clothed with righteousness, and let thy saints shout for joy. For thy servant David's sake, turn not away the face of thine anointed. The Lord has sworn it in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priest with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There will I make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained a lamp for mine anointed. His enemies will I clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. From the combined hymnal, let's sing hymn number 80, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Let's stand and sing number 80.
Amen. If you are able to kneel, let's kneel in prayer. Yes, Jesus, may you be crowned. May that day when you are lifted up, may that day when every eye sees and every tongue confesses that you are Lord, may that day come. Jesus, we love you. And we declare that together tonight, arm in arm, hand in hand, brothers and sisters, by the blood of Jesus, we say that we love you, Jesus, that we come into this place to worship you, to sit at your feet, to behold the beauty of the man Jesus of Nazareth, to behold his story from everlasting to everlasting, the man who has no beginning and no end, whose eternity is, is, um, has eternity in his eyes. And Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for what you've done in creating us. We thank you for what you're doing in sustaining us even now. We're so thankful for the blood, that by the blood spilt at Calvary, even sinners like us can be washed clean. Even sinners like us can be given entrance into a kingdom that we don't deserve. And so we say thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for choosing us for choosing Zion, that you've desired to dwell among human beings, and you will do so. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for putting on flesh. Thank you for becoming our brother, our friend, our bridegroom, and the one that we long for. We ask now, Father, that you would bless um, Tim Funk and pray, Father, for a quick recovery. We ask Jesus um, that he would recover in, in quick speed, Father. Holy Spirit, go to him and minister to him. We ask Jesus that you would be with those young men from Roanoke. We pray God healing on their bodies. We ask especially for Seth, Father, that you would heal his body, that he would be um, healed and ministered to even now in that hospital bed. We ask Jesus that you would be with us here tonight. We thank you for your abiding Holy Spirit, and we ask that he would work here tonight among us, that he would take the things of Jesus, and he would give them to us, that he'd give us eyes to see and ears to hear, uh, a spirit of wisdom and revelation. We ask God that you would bless us, help us, be with us. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So last time we were together, we looked at Psalm 89. And today we'll finish a trilogy of psalms about the Davidic covenant. Again, the psalms are such a unique place in Scripture because not only are they songs and poems, but they give commentary to the narrative. So we can read about what happened with the covenant that Yahweh makes with David in 2 Samuel 7, but we get this opportunity here tonight to hear commentary on it. What, what does Yahweh think about this? What What is God doing here with David? And we get this window that is just amazing. So last time we looked at Psalm 89 and we we talked about how Jesus is going to be the firstborn of all creation. Meaning that when he comes back, he as the firstborn of all the kings will will get to be the executor of state with the new creation. And he really will give cities to some people. He'll give five cities to some and in a few cities to others, and it really is about being faithful to him so that when he comes back, he will reward us and reward us um, amazingly. And we really do not only want to repent and believe in the blood that he spilled to give us entrance, but also to trust in that coming day because that coming day is going to be the day where everything gets revealed, restored, and of course, we want to, to worship him. So we talked about covenants last time. We'll talk about them again today with Psalm 72. And then we're going to introduce some new, th- or I'm sorry, with Psalms 132. And we'll get to introduce some new themes about the Davidic covenant, uh, specifically about the ark. We'll talk about the ark that was in the, the tabernacle. So let's do a quick summary of covenants again. Because if, if you were here, you weren't, weren't here last time, that's all right. We again just want to get a feel for what is a covenant. So the definition we worked out is when two parties governmentally are looking for mutual benefit. So we're looking for ways that both of us can be benefited and what we can do for each other. So we come up with stipulations that we'll have to meet and then we pledge allegiance to each other. 
And if we walk out those stipulations, then we get the mutual benefit. So we've used examples of hiring somebody to mow your lawn or a water company. But you could use any kind of that idea of you want what I have and I want what you have, so let's make a deal. Let's make a covenant. We talked also about how biblically all the major covenants that we're studying here about Jesus, they're all related to Genesis 3.15. Because in the beginning, the Adam and Eve sin, and, and Yahweh says to the snake, you will be on your belly, you will lick dust, and out of the seed of the woman will come a man who will smash your head. Although you wound his heel, he will smash your head and reverse all the curse, and namely the curse of death. So that is kind of the, 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 the root of the tree or the, the branch of the tree of all the covenants, that main idea. So then we come to the covenant with Abraham, and Abraham is promised again the seed language. Out of you, Abraham, will come a seed, and your seed will bless all the nations of the earth. That same thing happens then with Moses. The same kind of language, it will be a nation of priests, a priesthood of the Messiah. And then with David, we talked about it as well. All that same language of the seed that's coming, it's all get, it gets rooted from there. He says, David, I will make your name great. I will provide a place for my people Israel, and I'll plant them. I'll give you rest from your enemies. I'll raise up a seed to succeed you. Uh, your seed will build a house for me. That house was a temporary tabernacle in Moses' day, but uh, in Solomon's day, an actual building. And then Jesus, of course, will have a city that will come down from heaven. He says, uh, I will be your seed's father and he will be my seed's son. He says, you, David, you're one of your sons will sit on your throne forever. And there it's introduced, Jerusalem. Yahweh has chosen Jerusalem because one of David's sons will sit on his throne. That throne is in a literal city in Israel in a, in a city called Jerusalem. And God's forever king, his Messiah, that's where he will sit. So David, he hears this in 2 Samuel 7. He's stunned. He goes into the tabernacle and he says, who am I, Yahweh, that you would deal with this? And, and is this your way of dealing with man? It's a way of saying, this is the prophetic pathway for all the scriptures. This is the charter that you will travel. And it really is true. From, from David's promise or from David's covenant, we can track the rest of the scriptures, all looking for a son that will come, that will be a son of David who will be able to walk out the conditions or the stipulations of the covenant. And then, of course, Jesus establishes a new covenant in the upper room. And in that new covenant, the, the idea is introduced that it's not sacrifice from animals that will get you into that kingdom, but he himself will be the sacrifice. He himself will give you the justification on the day that you will get the not guilty plea if you're covered by the blood of Jesus. He will also give you the indwelling spirit. We said here uh, with our summary of covenants that all covenants are conditional. Although you may read in different theology books that say some are conditional, some are unconditional, the definition of a covenant, it has conditions to it. If you say something like an unconditional covenant, it doesn't, then words don't mean anything. We also said that none of the covenants have been fulfilled. Because Genesis 3.15 has not been fulfilled, Satan is still the God of this world. People still die. People still suffer. We can say none of the covenants have been fulfilled. And we looked at that when Jesus does the new covenant with his disciples, he says, you guys take this drink, you drink of it. I will not drink this cup. I will not drink wine again until it's fulfilled in the new kingdom, when I drink it with you in the new kingdom. We talked about how all the stipulations have the same base, all the covenants have the same base stipulations. For human beings, because we're sinners and we're sons of sinners, we must repent, repent continuously, and we also must believe in the coming Messiah. That's our part of the equation. We have to repent. We have to believe in the coming Messiah. Yahweh's part of it is that he will send the Messiah, and he will give you the grace to continue repenting. He will give you the grace to continue believing in Yahweh. And so that leads us now, as a long introduction, to Psalm 132. So let's turn our eyes to it. This is one of the songs of ascent. Psalms 120 to 132 were, are called historically the songs of ascent. And what would happen is the Israelites were required, you, by law, not, not, not all Israelites at all times, but 
they were required by law to travel to Jerusalem for three feasts, for Passover, for Pentecost, and for Tabernacle. And on their way, it wouldn't just be like, get there as quick as you can. It would be a festive throng that marches towards Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is up high geographically, so they're called the Songs of Ascent. And they'd sing these songs to each other. Songs one, Psalms 120 all the way to 135. Psalm 132 is the longest of all of these psalms. And it just because it has a lot about Jesus and David and, and other things like that. Other scholars have said, not only are these the songs of ascent, but it's also the songs that they would sing when they came back from the exile. So Cyrus gives a decree and they're allowed to return and they would sing these psalms to each other. And then others will point out that maybe these songs are also songs that will be sung eschatologically. Meaning when we come back with Jesus, we will sing these songs as we march into Jerusalem. And I think that is a, a wonderful picture. The author is unlisted here. We don't know who it is. I've seen good arguments for David and good arguments for Solomon, but I don't know. So when the scripture's silent, we're going to be silent as well. We're going to break it down the following way. This psalm is a, is a case study in Hebrew parallelism. So you'll see parallels to a lot of the different sections as we work through it. So verse 1 is an introduction to the context of the Davidic covenant, telling Yahweh to remember David. Verses 2 through 5 are David's oath to Yahweh, where we get to hear David say, this is what I'm going to swear to you, Yahweh. Verses then 6 through 9, um, are, I'm going to argue that it's, we're overhearing a couple of pilgrims during their time of ascent to Jerusalem, and we're going to hear what they have to say about what's going to happen Lots of debate about 6 through 9, who's talking there. I'm just going to give you my opinion as we work through it. Verse 10 is a standalone verse, and it parallels verse 1. If you look at verse 1 and verse 10, you can see that same idea of David remembering him for his sake. Then we have verses 13, no, sorry, 11 through 12 are Yahweh's oath to David. So in verses 2 through 5, David swore to Yahweh, but here in verse is 11 through 12, Yahweh is going to swear an oath to David. And I love how the two kind of parallel each other. And then finally, 13, not finally, 13 through 16 then is Yahweh's election of Jerusalem. And then verses 17 through 18 are just conclusions about this coming anointed one, this Messiah, this Christ. So let's read verse one together. Lord, remember David and all his afflictions. So we have the context starting out. Remember David. Yahweh, remember him in his life and remember his suffering. And remember, that is the apostolic pattern, is a pattern of suffering before glory. David's life was a type and an example of what Jesus' life was. Similarly, suffering before glory. So now let's look into verse 2 through 5. Start us out here with verse 2. How he swore unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. So David makes that he had... The Lord likely puts it in his heart, but he wants Yahweh not to just dwell in a tent, but to have a temple, a real building. We remember that story from 2 Samuel where he, he finishes his own palace and he's like, how can I dwell in a palace of cedar where my God dwells in a tent? That is not right. And he has that desire in his heart. So then we have these verses here in verses 4. He said, well, verses three through five, he says, surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to mine eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord, a habitation of the mighty God of Jacob. And when I read that, I, I assumed this was a direct quote of 2 Samuel or 1 Chronicles, but it isn't. This psalmist has a window into David's heart where David says, I'm not gonna sleep until Yahweh has a place to dwell. And I, I love that. It's a little window into David that we don't get in other parts of Scripture. But it really was a burning desire in his heart to have Yahweh dwell in a building. But, but now let's, let's talk a little bit about that. Where is Yahweh now? David is saying, I want you to dwell in a tabernacle. Well, in Israel, there is no, or I want you to dwell in a temple. In Israel, there is no temple. There is no tabernacle. Where does Yahweh dwell and how does he dwell? When you, when you ask people, where is God right now? A lot of um, worldview is revealed in that moment. And because most of us are Western Christians here, 
we tend to have what Randy Alcorn calls the idea of a Christoplatonism. Because Plato, the Greek philosopher, he divided up all of reality into two realms, uh, the physical and the non-physical, or the the material realm realm and, and the immaterial realm, or you could say the intelligible and the unintelligible. This idea of dual reality is what many Christians bring into the scriptures. When they read the first verse of the Bible and they say, God created the heavens and the earth, they immediately think through Plato's lens and thinks, oh, these are separate dimensions. But it's not that way. The Hebrew worldview says, no, Lord, the Yahweh created the heavens and the earth. He stretched them out. And they're continuous. There's not some sort of magical break in between the two. And the idea of Yahweh dwelling in the highest heaven is how the Hebrew worldview thought of it. And it wasn't just he dwells in the highest heaven apart from us. No, Isaiah 40 says he stretched out the heavens like a tent to live within. So Yahweh in the Hebrew worldview, he is highly exalted, but he's also near. He dwells with us. He's transcendent. He doesn't have to dwell within his creation, but he chooses to do so. And we're going we're gonna to zero in on that idea throughout this psalm. So have eyes to see it as we work through it. But the first, the first thing we want to talk about is does Yahweh have a form? Does he have a body? And the answer to that question biblically is yes. Because it, it says after six days of creating all things, Yahweh rests on the seventh day. In the Hebrew scripture or the Hebrew writings at the time, they say he, he rested by sitting on his universal throne above all things. But if, if, you, if you need to rest, you likely need to have a form or a body. But let's continue because he meets with Abraham and Abraham washes his feet. God has feet. It tells us later on that, um, that Jacob, Abraham's grandson, wrestles with Yahweh. He says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Later on, Moses is up on, on Mount Sinai and says, show me your glory. Yahweh says, I can't show you my face because you'd die, but I'll show you my back. Did you know that? Yahweh has a back. <laughs> yes, Yahweh has a form. And so David's desire to have Yahweh dwell with him in a temple is a good and right desire. Now, some people will talk about, well, during Solomon's prayer, he says, the highest heavens can't contain you, talking to God. But the idea of, of the highest heavens or being uh, greater than any, any, any heavens or any location is true. Yes, Yahweh is greater than all those things, but that doesn't mean he doesn't walk with us and dwell with us because he has a form. And this is the biblical narrative because what did God do with Adam and Eve in in Genesis 1, 2, and 3? Or Genesis 2 and 3? He walked with them. God has legs. He walked with them in the cool of the, 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 the day. That's also the narrative where things are going. That's what he says in Revelation 21. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Yahweh wants to dwell with us. This is the storyline that we're, we're watching. Is, is he dwelt with us in the garden? We rebelled, but he wants to dwell with us again. And he, he does dwell with us in different ways through his Holy Spirit and in, in by putting on flesh and walking among us as Jesus. But that's not the end of the story yet. The end of the story is you in your resurrected body with the Holy Spirit dwelling perfectly within you and you dwelling with Yahweh again walking with him in the cool of the day. This is the story that we're telling. So when David says, I'm not going to sleep until you have a place to dwell, that's a good and right heart. And that's why Yahweh blesses him. That's, that's the context of the covenant. Yes, I, put, I may have put that in your heart, David, but because of this, well, I'm going to build a house for you. You want to build a house for me, but David, I'm going to build a house for you and your house will be glorious. And I love that connection. I love this idea, and it also gives us a little preview of the ark. We want to we have that in our brain because that ark is a great little symbol of Yahweh dwelling with us. But let's keep going. We're now going to transition to what I consider a, a discussion overheard. So you are, let's imagine that you are one of those pilgrims. Maybe you're marching from the hill country to Jerusalem to go celebrate at the feast. And you come upon a couple of pilgrims and they're having a discussion. Let's hear what they say. Verse 6. Lo, 
We heard of it at Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of the wood. And you're thinking, what are they talking about? And they're talking about the ark. That's the story of the ark. During the time of Judges, the Israelites started using the ark as some sort of lucky charm. They thought, well, what, what if we just bring it out? Maybe we'll win our battles. And in, second, in, second, no, in first Samuel, they have a devastating, a devastating uh, failure of a battle. That time, the wicked sons of Eli are killed. When Eli hear, and the Philistines steal the ark, when Eli hears of it, he falls backwards and dies. And the Philistines take the ark to their land, and you guys probably know that story. It goes terrible for them. So they eventually send it back to Israel on a donkey, just hoping it gets there. And eventually it ends up in some guy's house. And for like 20 years, during the whole time of Saul, Saul doesn't care about the ark. It just sits at some guy's house for years and years and years. But these pilgrims said, we heard about it. We found it in the fields of the wood. And David brought it back. It's, it's one of the glorious stories there. So the other one says, yeah, verse 7, we will go into his tabernacles. We will worship at his footstool. And again, there it is right there. We will worship at his footstool. What is the footstool biblically? Well, you, you can take it two different ways. Oftentimes, the, the scriptures will say, the heavens, heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. And you can read that in um, Isaiah 66 and Matthew 5, Jesus says it. But more common is heaven is his throne in the ark, that box that they kept those sacred items that they carried around that was in the Holy of Holies. The ark is his footstool. You can read that in 1 Chronicles 28, Psalm 99, Lamentations 2. And so they say, let's go worship at his footstool. The idea is let's go worship at his feet. And I love this idea because one time a year, the high priest would go in on during the Day of Atonement and he would go before the ark. And that was Yahweh's feet. But a footstool is part of king vocabulary. So you think of a king and there's a bunch of kind of words that go al along with the word king, right? One is kingdom. Kings have to have a kingdom. Uh, the other one is throne. That's a big narrative in the scripture because it decrees governmental power. And so you read Revelations 4 and 5 one day and underline every time you see the word throne or it because that's, that goes right along with who a king is. A king sits on a throne. A king has a scepter. It's been prophesied from Genesis 49, Numbers 24, Psalm 2, etc., etc. Yeah, the Messiah will have a scepter, a rod of iron that he will rule from. He has a crown. We'll read about the crown today in verse 18. But obviously in, Revelation, uh, in the book of Revelation, we see Jesus with the crown. We see him at the cross with the crown of thorns as the crown of suffering. But he will not wear that crown forever. He will wear the crown above all crowns. But there's one other, there's one other part that comes with kingly language, and that is a footstool. Now, here's the question is why a footstool... What do you need a footstool for? <laughs> and here's what it is. If you want an exalted throne, like a throne really, really high, your king has to be kind of big too. Because, and if anybody here is really short, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just going to talk about this for a little bit. But one of my wife's friends is, a, is a, a shorter lady. And when she comes to our house, she'll sit on the, the stairs or the, uh, the chairs and her feet will just dangle over the edge. And it's just not really um, dignified, if I could say so. It kind of makes people look like a little kid. So if you want an exalted throne, you need, you need your king to put his feet on something. So the king doesn't have little dangly feet because kings need to be dignified, right? So what do they do? They make these big, huge thrones because they want to show how this person is so important governmentally. But then they also will build a footstool for them that they would be able to put their feet on solid ground and look really dignified. Okay, so now the Hebrew worldview, remember, it's not different dimensions. The Hebrew worldview says heavens are, heavens are his throne and the earth or the ark is his footstool. It's where Yahweh puts his feet. Remember the, the context. He is highly exalted, a throne above all other thrones, but he's also near. His feet are on the earth his feet are on the ark. It's his footstool. And when we worship at his footstool, we're worshiping at his feet. 
a picture of Genesis 3.15, maybe his feet that are going to crush all his enemies, but also just a picture of deep humility. Yes, you are exalted, Jesus. We are at your feet. And it's, not a, it's no accident that in Luke 10, when all, the other, when all the other pilgrims are marching into Jerusalem so that they can worship at the temple for tabernacles, and it's a temple that has no ark, one young maiden, Mary of Bethany, she sits at his feet. She knows where Yahweh is. He's not in that temple with no ark. She's at Jesus' feet listening to his words. I want you to catch the symbolism here. So that's the picture of the ark. We, we want to see the ark as the place where Yahweh dwells, where he places his feet. And that desire in David's heart to see the ark put into a real building is a good and right desire. That is the prophetic pathway. That is where all things are going. So then, verse 8, it says, Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. And this language of arise is get off your throne. And we saw this already in Psalm 68, which quotes Numbers 10. When the Israelites were in the desert, the glory cloud, when it was time to move, it would move ahead. And they would say to themselves, oh, here we go. It's time for us to move. And they would say the same thing all the time. Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. They quote that in Psalm 68. And this is another version of the same. It is a Maranatha cry. Lord, come into thy rest. Please come to the ark of thy strength. Verse 9, let thy priests be clothed with righteousness and let thy saints shout for joy. Verse 9 is almost an exact parallel with verse 16. Look at verse 16. Yahweh says, I will also clothe her priests with salvation and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. And again, I just want to say it. If you're a person and you need joy, and we all do because the joy of the Lord is our strength, the way to get joy is not by trying to change your circumstances here in this present evil age. You can do that, and sometimes it'll work out well, but eternal abiding joy comes from looking to the future and the eternal joy that you will have in a resurrected body on a restored Jerusalem in a, in a kingdom that will never end, and the increase of his government will go on and on and on. If you want joy in your life, reach forward to that future joy that you will have in your resurrected body. All right, verse 10 is a standalone parallel to verse 1, remembering David. But now we can launch into 11 and 12. So we talked already about how David makes this vow to Yahweh, but now here in 11 and 12, Yahweh is going to make a vow to David. Let's see what he says. The Lord has sworn it in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony, that I shall teach them, their children shall sit upon thy throne forevermore. So David, you think you made this vow with me? Well, I have a vow to make with you. This is the covenant that Yahweh makes with David. One of your children will sit on your throne forever. Now, it's a conditional covenant because that, that seed of David has to actually walk out rightly the stipulations. And it looked like Solomon was going to be it, but then Solomon blows it. He's not the forever king. He didn't stay on the throne forever. Nor his son, nor his son, nor his son. Even the good kings, Josiah, Asa, they still fail. They don't sit on David's throne forever. What we need is a king who will be able to walk out righteousness forever. We have that in Jesus. We have that in the man from Nazareth who will, is, as the son of David, will sit on his throne and will walk out perfect righteousness. And that's the, the oath that Yahweh will not uh, revoke, that one of, his, one of David's descendants will sit on that throne forever. Because look at verse 12. It is an if clause. If thy children will keep my covenant and my testimony. None of David's sons did, but there will be a son of David who will sit on that throne and will keep those covenants, those commandments. That is the prophetic pathway of all of scriptures. I was struck the other day because I was reading in Mark 11 about the triumphal entry. Those pilgrims, they're, they're coming into Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And likely those pilgrims on their way, they were singing Psalm 132. They were supposed to sing the Psalms of Ascent, and 132 is one of them. 
So on their way up to Jerusalem, they're singing about this ascent, and then they see Jesus riding in on a donkey, and they know about him because they're from out of town. They're not one of the leaders in Jerusalem. They see Jesus. They know about him. Likely some of them have seen him do miracles, and so they start declaring it. They start saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They start quoting Psalm 118, and then they say, and blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. The pilgrims, as they see Jesus march into Jerusalem on a donkey, they say, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. We talked about this when we looked at Psalm 72. The blind men declaring, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. The idea of Jesus as a son of David, even though there hasn't been a Davidic king on the throne for 500 years, they are all talking about it. They're saying, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. They have a real hope that one day, one of David's sons will sit on his throne. That's why they're saying that. They know Jesus is from the line of David. They know he's doing things that the Messiah should do. So they cry out and say, yes, come. And they they actually expect him to take over Jerusalem, to sit on the throne. Now they were wrong because it's a story of suffering before glory, but they were right in that one day he will. He really will march from the Mount of Olives. This time, the next time, he won't descend from the Mount of Olives. He'll actually split the Mount of Olives into two, and he will march up to that throne and sit on that throne forever. All right, let's look at verse 13 and 16. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Here will I dwell, for I have desired it. And this gets into election. Because of the Reformation, most of the times when we hear the word election, we immediately go into like a Calvinistic realm and we think about who's saved and not saved and who was predestined before to go to hell and who's predestined to go to heaven. When you hear the word election or the Lord choosing something, that's not where you're supposed to go biblically. When you hear the word election or you hear the, word, the, word, the idea of Yahweh choosing something, you should think about Abraham because the Lord chose Abraham. You should think about how he chose Isaac or Jacob, how he chose the the nation of Israel. And here he says, I have chosen Zion. Zion is a literal hill in the literal city of Jerusalem, in the literal country of Israel. And that is where he will rest forever. There's a reason that you can't avoid news about Israel, because Yahweh has made his claim to it. He says, that's where I will live forever. And Satan knows that too. So most of the just terrible demonic activity that we've seen for 2,000 years have been about that election, have been about that city. There's a reason it's not going to get out of the news. You'll always hear about Zion because the Lord has made it known that that is where he will dwell forever. That's how we should think of biblical election because Yahweh wants to dwell there with there in his body with men forever. That's the drama of the garden. And you can see pictures of the garden in 15 and 16. Look at it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden, the, the fruit just, just came up whenever they, they could eat whenever they want. It was blessed that way. In verse 16, I will also clothe her priest with salvation and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. Just like Adam and Eve were were not clothed and they were embarrassed by their nakedness after the sin, he will clothe them again, but not with not with clothes, but with salvation. And that that word salvation is actually similar to Jesus' name in Hebrew. I'll clothe them with Jesus, which is a great biblical term, an idea throughout. So there we see an Eden-like blessing throughout. Now, verses 17 through 18, we have the anointed one. His, his horn and his lamp. So let's talk about, the, let's read this one. There will I make the horn of David to bud. I have ordained the lamp for my anointed ones. And that, okay, that idea of the, the horn of David comes from uh, 1 Samuel 7. When Hannah drops off um, Samuel to the aged priest Eli, she sings that psalm, that prophecy. And she's the first one to prophesy with the phrase, the anointed one, or the Messiah, 
or the Christ in Greek. She says, The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. That same language is picked up here by the psalmist in verse 17. There will I make the horn of David to bud. David is a king, just like, uh, just like Hannah prophesied, and his horn will be exalted. And verse, the second part of verse 17 is interesting too. I have ordained a lamp for mine anointed. What happened when the Israelites lost the ark in that battle? Well, 2 Samuel tell, or 1 Samuel tells us that the light went out, the lamps went out. That wasn't supposed to happen. Those lamps were supposed to be forever lit, or at least lit day and night. But when they lost the ark, Samuel tells us, and the lamp went out. This picture then, the psalmist is saying, the lamp from mine anointed I have ordained. And I love this picture of Jesus as the light, or Jesus as the lamp. Because he himself is so glorious, he dwells in inapproachable light. And in that coming city, we won't need the sun or the moon because he himself will be the glorious lamp that lights our way in our path. I love that idea of who he is and what he will be, the light of the nations forever. Finally, verse 18. Again, we have some Eden language. His enemies will I clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. Just like Adam and Eve rejected, were, were embarrassed by their nakedness, Yahweh says, his, his enemies I'll clothe with shame, but upon himself shall his crown flourish. That government, when Jesus reigns on the earth, will continue to grow and grow and grow. So let's take a look at the New Testament. Um, Stephen in Acts 7, he has an allusion to it, but let's not read that. Peter directly quotes verse 11 in his first sermon in Acts 2, but let's not read that. Zechariah, he prophesies after John the Baptist, his son is born. He prophesies and quotes a section of it, but let's not read that. Let's read uh, Paul's introduction to his gospel in Romans 1. And I know Mike did uh, Romans 1 on Sunday morning, but we'll just read uh, the introduction here and we'll be done just because I want us to see it. And what I want us to see is that the New Testament is not this radical break from the Old Testament, as sometimes is taught or thought about. As if if looking at the covenants, a lot of my, my friends will be like, well, all that old covenant stuff, it doesn't matter because the new covenant is here. As if God was just making Jewish people jump through hoops to point some example. Or as if, the, the Jewish story is all done, and it's all about us Gentiles now. And they actually get the picture reversed. No, it, it, it's actually us Gentiles getting grafted into the covenants, getting grafted into the story. And so let's see how Paul introduces himself and his gospel here. And we'll just do these first four verses. Actually, we'll do five. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So this gospel that we've been separated unto, that Paul has as an apostle, it has been promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So the prophets are declaring the gospel. Now, if you ask most Christians and say, well, what is the gospel? They're going to give you this story. Well, Jesus died, you're a sinner, and he's going to let you go to heaven. Well, it says here that the the prophets have declared the gospel, and that was before the time of Jesus. It says that that Abraham heard the gospel. Jesus, before before his death and resurrection, he's preaching the gospel. He's telling his disciples to preach the gospel of the kingdom. What does this gospel mean? Well, let's keep going. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, there we have Jesus' name, which is Jesus. We also have son. He is Yahweh, as Yahweh's son. And then we have Christ. Christ is a title. It's not a name. And we have Lord. Lord is a title there. It's not a name. So a few years ago, I was kind of like, I'm going to try to stop using Christ as a name because it kind of messes up the story. Instead, I'm going to say Jesus the Messiah, or I could say Jesus the Christ. Because Christ isn't a name. It means the anointed one. 
And if we can think of Jesus, the anointed one, it gives us a much better picture of the story. So yes, let's keep going about this gospel. Jesus is Yahweh's son, fully divine, fully man. He is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, God's forever king to rule over all things. He is also our Lord. He is the one who did creation. Jesus is the one creator God. Let's keep going though. Which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So Paul doesn't say, well, those dumb Jews, that they believed on this old covenant stuff, but now we're in the new covenant. No, he says, no, Jesus is the seed of David. That same seed language from Genesis 3.15, reinforced with Abraham's seed language, reinforced here with David. He is the seed of David according to the flesh. The one that 2 Samuel 7 says will come and sit on David's throne forever. Verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. He was publicly known to be the Son of God. How? By power. By by telling the wind and the waves, be quiet. And they were quiet. By resurrecting people from the dead, by demonstrating his power as Yahweh. Because only Yahweh could do what Jesus was doing. According to the spirit of holiness, how do we know that he was holy? Because he raised from the dead. Because sinners like you and me, when we die, we stay dead. But Jesus was too holy for the grave. And when he came out of the grave, he was known to be holy because this man had never sinned. And not only was he, was he declared that way to be holy by his resurrection of the dead, but also by the resurrection of the dead because it was his voice that called Lazarus out of the tomb, but it will also be Jesus' same voice that will call you out of the tomb if you're found in him on the day of the Lord, if you repent and if you believe in Yahweh. Finally, verse 5, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Again, that idea of obedience to the faith, faith in what? Faith in that coming Messiah. Faith in his cross, his death, his resurrection, and his coming day. That is the faith that we believe in. Those same stipulations from the beginning of all the covenants to repent of our sins and to believe in the coming Messiah. So how do we respond to Psalm 132? And how do we respond to what Paul calls his gospel, demonstrating that Paul understands the covenants and has not said, oh, all that has been fulfilled in the new covenant? No. He's demonstrating this Jesus is the one of the covenants. From Genesis 3.15, from the Abrahamic covenant to the Mosaic covenant to the Davidic covenant, it is about Jesus. Well, what we do is we trust in the story, these eternal covenants, because he is faithful to his covenants. That's why we can trust him. So we do our part. We repent of our sins continuously. We're in this present evil age. We repent of our sins We believe in the coming Messiah, trusting in his blood to cleanse us from every sin and trusting in his coming day when he will make all things right, when one of David's seeds will sit on his throne and will be the light to the nations, will be the ark of the covenant, will put his feet on that footstool and we will worship at his feet. He will give us the light of understanding, his life, his death, and his resurrection. Maranatha. I appreciate the completeness of the word tonight and the picture that was presented of ultimate salvation. That the promise was made uh, way back in the beginning. It was carried through the kings and the, or the king of David and the prophets and carried on through to the apostles. And it's there for us today. Um, David stopped reading at verse five and I couldn't help but think uh, of verse six when Paul turns to the Romans and says, among whom ye also are called, there are, sorry, among whom ye also are ye also the called of Jesus Messiah. And so the charge goes to us today to continue to trust in him. That was a beautiful picture, and I think it calls us to that, that coming kingdom. Uh, appreciate the encouragement that we got from that. Uh, I couldn't, I was flipping, thinking of a couple songs, and at the beginning of our combined hymnal, near the beginning, number 25, Come Thou Almighty King, perhaps we could sing that together. Oh, 
Appreciate all that have gathered with us tonight. We would ask one of our brothers to close the service in prayer. Brother Roger Geyer, would you be willing to do that for us? He's over on this other side. Let's pray. Lord, we are grateful to be able to come to church this evening and to hear thy word and to be blessed and, and to grow in understanding and grace. We thank you for fellowship we enjoy and, and we pray for the many who couldn't be here and, and for those who are in sorrow and grief and, and those who have poor health. And we're just grateful that you've blessed us richly at this time and and we pray it all in thy name. Amen. Thank you, Roger, for the prayer. Do we have any greetings that you'd like to share tonight? If not, I'll go into the announcements. Um, the Lighthouse Academy benefit, we've been announcing that. That is actually tomorrow night at Five Points in Washington. Uh, there's no admission or anything. There's just a donation collected there for the benefit of Lighthouse. Uh, on Saturday night, this weekend, uh, July 16th, 4 to 7, is the Midwest Food Bank fundraiser, and that's the drive through experience with meals available. Um, contact Brother Tom Reeker if you're interested in, in participating in that. Uh, and then Sunday are the Peoria Rescue Mission services. So that's Sunday at 7 o'clock. And we're just asking those with the last name I through M to attend um, just to help support that. Anyone is welcome. We appreciate your, your uh, encouragement in that. But um, just encourage those, especially with, with last names I through M, to, to be there. Uh, the collection running this week is the operating fund. And then we got an email today from uh, Brother Tim Funk, and he just kind of gave us an update um, just to share a little bit of that with you, you know, his current condition challenges are, uh, he's just has headaches that kind of come and go, um, a little bit of facial weakness, and um, just some patience and healing. Um, of course, they also, he, he basically said he has a bad haircut because they had to do work on one side of his head. So just some things um, for him. But he just really expressed, more importantly, some thankfulness um, that the surgery went well. He does have some hearing in his right ear. Um, he's just thankful for Deb, who's been so supportive to him. Um, he's seen improvements every day, and he just said the Lord's been good to him. And so uh, encouraged by that, and just, just continue in prayer for him. Uh, also, prayers for our brother Tim Roker, who's 
Uh, he's quarantining now because he's had a shoulder surgery tomorrow, and so um, prayers for him for a, a safe surgery and a, and a speedy recovery. And then those that were in the accident in Roanoke, I think most of us are aware of those young men. The email went out yesterday about that, and we just uh, continue in prayer for them. That'll conclude our service for tonight. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out, and may God be with us in the remainder of this week.